tardes, good afternoon. I'm Jose Arelza, Secretary General of the Aspen Institute España, and it's a great pleasure to be here and to welcome all of you uh, to this public lecture and colloquium uh, with Gideon Rackman. Um, let me just very quickly say um, a word about what we do in Aspen España. Uh, we were launched uh, four years and a half ago, and uh, our host uh, here today, Uria, uh, had a lot to do with this venture, and we're grateful for everything that they do now. They sit in our board of trustees, and today they're hosting us. So a big thanks to, to Uria Menendez. Um, and a group of, of Spaniards had the vision of creating a platform for debates on leadership and public policies modeled after the Aspen US, the famous Aspen Institute that has served now for almost 70 years as a venue uh, to discuss about the good society, uh, to, ha to have the most interesting and uh, innovative debates about how to move from importance to significance, how to develop uh, the leaders that we need in, in our society. So we're still in Spain, a small uh, foundation, but we are growing every year and we, we have a fantastic team. We have the best trustees and now we have all of you also as friends. Um, but today the, the important um, person in, in the room is Gideon Ragman. Um, and I have asked uh, our friend uh, Fidel Senaorta, who has moderated uh, already some of our Aspen activities, to introduce him. Fidel Senaorta is uh, Director General uh, for North American Affairs, Asian and Pacific Affairs uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he has been many, many uh, things in his long career as a diplomat. Also, he's um, a writer. Uh, and if I may also disclose something very personal, he's a great poet. So, Fidel, thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you, uh, Gideon. Um, you have the floor. Fidel. Thank you, Jose. I, I don't know if uh, poetry is relevant, but I appreciate very much your introduction. Um, as, as many, uh, increasingly more and more diplomats in, in Spain and, and all around the world, I start my day uh, reading the Financial Times and, uh, and reading the, uh, the excellent analysis by Gideon Rachman and his colleagues in the Financial Times. That, let's say, is my intellectual breakfast every day. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, Gideon Rachman is his, the chief foreign affairs commentator in Financial Times. He was in, in, started his, his career in journalism in the BBC World Service and then was Sunday correspondent in Washington, D.C. And uh, after 15 years at The Economist, where he served in, in Bangkok as, as uh, Southeast Asia correspondent, and then uh, in, back in Britain, and then in Brussels as, as Charlemagne, European Affairs uh, writer of, uh, of this column. And he, he's now at the Financial Times uh, uh, since 2006. Uh, today... Uh, we, we come to listen to him on the use of power by the U.S., our ind indispensable ally, and it is telling that the, recommending, the recommended uh, reading for, for preparing this, this lecture is, is a piece at uh, the National Interest um, magazine, which uh, uh, since its creation has been known, has been associated with a realist school of thought uh, in, in, in international affairs. And one can really see the affinities between uh, Gideon Rechman uh, thinking and, and this realist school at his best in, in many uh, points. In, in first, in the importance devoted to, to geographical and historical uh, background of every matter that, uh, that he approaches. Secondly, in his belief that the defense of freedom and democracy are always better served with a measure of skepticism toward this messianic uh, view that wants to export democracy to everyone in the world. As Kissinger used to say, virtue run amok. Uh, 
in, in his grasp, of course, of the many layers of power and, and, the, and the need to back military power with uh, a healthy economy and also uh, this power of attraction that uh, usually is being called the soft power, and in his proposition that the use of force is always the last resort and not the first. And to sum up, I would say uh, he's, uh, as he will uh, elaborate uh, right now, he's uh, a believer like I am too, and I think many of, of us around this, this room, in, the, in, the, in American power, in the strength of America as a beneficial factor uh, in the world order, but also in the in a prudent leadership of the United States. And prudence, I think, is a, is a very important virtue in the thinking of Gideon Richman as he approaches the use of American power. You know. Well, th thank you very much for that uh, very thoughtful introduction. It's, uh it's quite helpful for me to have what I think summarized, and I think quite accurately. Um, so the, um, the talk today is about this global test of U.S. power, by which I mean uh, uh, I'm looking at really the way in which Obama's policies have been interpreted around the world as he comes towards the, the last uh, year of his presidency. I would argue that it's been a pretty successful presidency, uh, both at home and abroad, but I'm not sure that that would be the verdict that uh, the commentariat in Washington would, would currently embrace, where there's a sort of sense that uh, the U.S. has let things slip under Obama. Perhaps people have short memories. They, uh, they were pretty angry with the, the end, by the end of the Bush presidency by an over-assertive U.S. foreign policy. And now I think, both in the U.S. and, and in large parts of the rest of the world, there's a sense that Obama's overcorrected and moved too much in the other direction. I think it's true that ever since the end of the Cold War, so back to 1989, the, the overwhelming power of the American military has been probably the central fact of international politics. And I think it is the case that now in three crucial areas, Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia, America's rivals have begun to test its resolve to use that power. And faced with three serious security challenges in those regions. The U.S. is facing a similar set of questions. It has to consider when and whether to push back. And meanwhile, its allies in, in Asia and in Europe uh, and, and in the Middle East sort of watch from the sidelines and sometimes have different views about how exactly the Americans should react. So these events, although they're taking place in different parts of the world, I'd argue that they're quite closely connected because it is American military might that in the end, we're beginning to realize guarantees borders all over the world. So in the Middle East, the U.S. has giant naval and air bases in Qatar and Bahrain, which exist to reassure its regional allies and also to intimidate its rivals. In East Asia, the U.S. Navy has become used to treating the Pacific, as one Pentagon official put it to me, as an American lake, guaranteeing freedom of navigation and, again, supporting its network of alliances. And in Europe, it's NATO that guarantees the territorial integrity of its member states. And NATO is increasingly an American underpinned organization. So that if you go back to 2001, the US accounted for just 50% of NATO military spending. Now they account for around 70 to 75% of NATO military spending. And these security orders are now under challenge in, in all three regions. In Europe, we've been most preoccupied by Russia's intervention in Ukraine, which has led directly to the movement of NATO troops into the Baltic states on a rotational basis, increasingly avert nuclear threats from the Kremlin, uh, and talk of a new Cold War. And the Putin government's seizure of Crimea from Ukraine in 2014 was a big moment. It represented the first forcible annexation of territory on the European continent since the end of the Second World War. And the subsequent Russian intervention in eastern Ukraine, although denied in Moscow, not very convincingly, created strong pressure on the Obama administration to supply weapons to the government of Ukraine. Now, the White House has refused to take that step, and this has been added to the charge sheet of those who say that Obama's been weak, that he failed to supply weapons to the Ukrainians. However, NATO has stepped up its presence in the Baltics. And that's a response to the widespread fear in those states that they are vulnerable to potential Russian uh, military moves, whether in a direct sense or more likely as some kind of hybrid warfare. And that in turn has made NATO members think much harder about the famous Article 5 commitment that we make to each other to defend each other. And a lot of 
European countries are thinking, well, what happens if there is a direct challenge to Estonia, Latvia or Lithuania? How do we respond to that? So that's one set of challenges. In the Middle East, meanwhile, Russia has also intervened, as we know, in recent uh, months in the, in the Syrian civil war. And that, I think, has helped to underline the extent to which the U.S. has lost control of that region following the upheavals of the Arab Spring and America's withdrawal of troops from Iraq. Um, until the, uh, the upheavals of the Arab Spring and recent events, you could, you could see that America had very close security relationships or political relationships with really all the key countries in that region. So with Israel, but also with Egypt, with Turkey, with Saudi Arabia. Now, all of those different alliances are under different forms of strain. And with the Americans visibly reluctant, the whole point of the Obama presidency, after all, in foreign policy was to end those wars, with them reluctant to get involved in further boots-on-the-ground activity in the Middle East, the Russians noted a power vacuum in Syria and moved quickly to attempt to fill it. Now, we're noticing now that that has been problematic for the Russians, but it clearly did create, again, this impression that America was pulling back, and even by, by firing cruise missiles into Syria, it seemed to me the Russians were even staging a kind of mocking emulation of the early stages of America's interventions in Iraq, showing that they could do this too. And Russia's actions in Syria also created the risk of a military collision with the United States, because both countries' air forces are carrying out missions in the same airspace. And in fact, as we've seen over the last week now, there was actually a clash with Turkey, which again brings up this whole question of Article 5, because Turkey is a NATO member. And uh, we've been worrying for the last year about, well, would we back up uh, the Baltic states? Turkey raises a whole other set of questions, because uh, President Erdogan is perhaps not the most stable of uh, allies. He's, on the other hand, any member of NATO is, uh, has the right to call upon Article 5. So uh, it's a potentially very tricky situation. The clarity of Russia's support for Bashar al-Assad has also seemed to mark a stark contrast with the confusion of American and indeed broader Western policy in Syria, where we in the West seem to have sometimes been on both sides of the civil war, wanting both Assad and ISIL to fail. Um, and whereas the Russians at least have, as uh, people say, you know, one horse that they are backing. Um, and America's traditional allies in the Middle East have as a result, partly as a result, rounded on the Obama administration, charging it with weakness. So all these relationships that I outlined earlier are now uh, frayed. So Benjamin Netanyahu has accused the White House of concluding a disastrous nuclear deal with Iran that he claims is tantamount to appeasement. The Saudis are also very unhappy with that American rapprochement with Iran, and they also haven't forgiven the U.S. for, as they see it, betraying Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. So, picture of America challenged in, in Europe and in the Middle East. Meanwhile, in Asia, I think the challenge that most worries the kind of strategic thinkers in the U.S. who are trying to look forward 20 years is the one of China. And that's begun to take much more shape over the last year with this island building program. Who knew you could build islands? But what they've been doing is essentially taking little reefs and what they call land reclamation exercises, but they're so extensive that they've turned things that were essentially below water into somewhere where you can put entire airstrips and so on. And this is important because China's long had this notional claim to what they call the Nine Dashed Line, which essentially is the whole of the South China Sea, uh, stretching all the way down to Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and these are significant waters because something like 50% of the world's commercial traffic goes through the South China Sea because of the importance of East Asia to the global economy. Now, that was always a largely theoretical claim, but by potentially building islands that could be turned into military bases, um, that poses a challenge to the idea that these are, this is an American lake. Because if you have a, a whole series of dots around the South China Sea from which China can then draw 12-mile or 100-mile exclusion zones around, potentially you, could, you can then shut the U.S. Navy out of those areas, which is why the Americans decided to challenge the idea that China has established territorial waters around these new artificial islands by a couple of months ago, sailing a, a ship, the USS Lassen, within 12 miles of one of these new features. However, even this action has not completely assuaged those who say, well, Obama's being weak because they say that 
the Americans waited too long, they agonized too openly, they took too many months, and in the end it wasn't that much, and it's not going to stop the Chinese. And it certainly isn't going to be the end of the matter, because the, while the U.S. Navy has made it clear that it plans regular patrols within the 12-mile zone, the Chinese have said that they will react, and if they decide to place military installations or troops on some of these recent islands, then uh, everyone will then look again to Washington to see how they react. So this is a situation that's going to play out over many months. Now, I think all these three disputes in different areas are a reminder that although we all talk about a borderless world, and when it's true, it's true enough when it comes to things like climate change and so on, that national frontiers don't matter so much as they used to, in international politics, actually the control of territory is still very fundamental. And Sir Robert Cooper, who's a distinguished British diplomat, uh, I saw discussing this issue recently, and he said, world orders are territorial orders, and if you don't know who owns territory, you really don't know anything about international order. So this question of borders, which we thought, well, maybe it didn't really matter so much in globalized age, it turns out it does matter quite a lot. And uh, America's role as a guarantor of borders is, I think, really part of, uh, central to this challenge to American power. But beyond that question of borders and how far the Americans will push back and so on, there's these three regional challenges pose a, a, a big global question, which is sort of unanswered as yet, and that's how long can America, which is a country that represents less than 5% of the world's population, and 22% of the world economy. And according to some estimates now, some say the Chinese economy is actually now larger than that of the United States. How long can America continue to be the dominant military and political power in every significant region of the world, in Asia, in Europe, in the Middle East? And that question in turn raises further issues because it also raises the question of the role of America's allies in supporting these regional orders. And a question, a very sensitive one, of how far should America perhaps make some concessions to Russia and to China and allow them a sphere of influence? Is that something they should be considering? And finally, the question of, does America have to react in the same way every time it's challenged? Uh, does it have to push back every time? Some people believe it has to because if it shows weakness in one part of the world, that will encourage challenges in the other. Others will say, no, uh, they have to be selective, that not all these challenges are the same, and you have to be uh, careful about where you apply your power. On this question of allies, the Obama administration's relationship with its allies is much more complicated than you might assume. So the, the narrative of American weakness that you hear, particularly in Washington, might lead you to imagine that uh, all of America's allies are constantly clamoring for it to push back hard. And that picture is closest to the truth in the Middle East, where both Israel and Saudi Arabia have been pretty obvious about their desire that... Uh, the U.S. take on Iran, if necessary, in a military fashion. But the Obama administration has re remained, understandably, I think, skeptical about whether taking on Iran, while it might be in the interest of Saudi Arabia, is it necessarily in the interest of the United States? And they have been willing to risk a confrontation with their key allies, Israel and Saudi Arabia, in the effort to pursue a rapprochement with Iran. Um, in Europe, America's NATO allies have been divided amongst themselves about how to react to Russia's actions in Ukraine. And generally speaking, the further east you go, the greater the demand for a tough American reaction with the Bolts and the Poles saying, you know, supply weapons to the Ukrainians, send troops to the Baltic states. The German government, however, clearly opposed to supplying weapons to Ukraine and German industry very upset about sanctions. And then beyond the elite level, opinion surveys suggest, interestingly, that Europeans are actually less prepared to confront Russia than Americans. So there was a Pew survey which asked, the Pew Opinion Poll survey, which said, uh, asked respondents whether they would support using military force to defend a NATO ally neighboring Russia, i.e. the Baltic states, that got into a serious military conflict with Russia. And interestingly, 56% of Americans said that you should respond in a military way. But no, there was not a majority for that anywhere in Europe. And in Germany, the support was as low as 38%. So the Americans, I think, understandably would say, well, look, if the Europeans are not prepared to resist the Russians, why, why are we being asked to do it on their behalf? And that is, I think, going to be increasingly a question uh, that, that sort of gnaws away at the center of the NATO alliance. It's reflected in spending patterns, but it's also reflected in political reactions. Um, America's Asian allies are also, I think, ambivalent about how confrontational they want to see the U.S. be in responding to China. Uh, 
So I, don't, I haven't come across any of them that look forward to the idea of a Beijing-dominated East Asia. Uh, however, countries like Singapore and South Korea, uh, South Korea, I think there's something like 40,000 U.S. troops there because of the legacy of the Korean War. Uh, Singapore, American ships r- regularly go through. But it's an interesting sign of the Singaporean ambivalence that if you say to the Singaporeans, of course, you, America has a naval base here, their sort of color will drain from their face. And they say, no, 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 it's not a naval base. They just pass through kind of regularly. And they don't even allow the American Navy to get off the ships. They have to sleep on the, on the ships because they don't want it to be called a Navy base. And that's because they're very worried about antagonizing the Chinese. Um, and so there are, again, there's a range of reactions. The Japanese government, which is in a pretty serious confrontation with China, which has been lasting for some years, is very keen on American assertiveness. But again, the Japanese public, not so clear. They re- very much resisted the Japanese government's, or resisted. The Japanese government had a real problem getting through a rewriting of their constitution, which would allow the Japanese army to fight alongside the Americans, because they, like the Germans, have a strong pacifist strain uh, in their thinking. Um, so again, it's a picture of, of ambivalence. And if in Washington you're trying to get a clear steer, it seems to me that there are times when it seems like the Americans are keener on pushing back against China than their allies, with the important exception of Japan and possibly the Philippines. So lying behind these Russian and Chinese challenges to U.S. power is a common dilemma. And that dilemma is, is this a mistake? Should the Americans just say, well, look, the world's changing, and we have to accept that other major powers will have a kind of zone of influence in their neighborhoods? However, this idea of spheres of influence, zones of influence, is very unfashionable. It's not something you can really admit to in Washington. In fact, it's become so unfashionable that John Kerry has even said that the Monroe Doctrine, which is the famous doctrine that the U.S. will keep other powers out of its hemisphere, Kerry says that no longer applies. We don't believe in spheres of influence. We believe in the universal application of uh, international law, and we believe that countries should be allowed to make their own choices. Um, However, I think in reality... um, the Americans are at least toying with the idea of, of some kind of concession of sphere of influence. And, in re- uh, and there is a, a sense that pa- perhaps you have to give the Chinese and the Russians a little bit of space so that a classic example, I would say, is the American acceptance of what seems to be a slightly crazy insistence by China that there is only one China and that Taiwan is a rebel province that it can never be allowed to be independent. Now, I think, you know, if we were left entirely to the Western political thinking, we would say, well, that's unacceptable, that's ob- objectionable, but as a matter of real politique and as part of the rapprochement with China under Nixon, the Americans accepted that, although they haven't said that they would allow China to enforce that through military force. On the contrary, they're pledged to defend Taiwan. But there's a kind of sense of, of sphere of influence going on there. And I think that... In Europe, there's also some people, particularly when it comes to China, who, begi- who are beginning to think that, well, maybe you should allow more Chinese space in the Pacific. So that uh, there was one uh, British minister who, the British have gone out of their way to court the Chinese lately and are subject to some controversy, both in Washington and in London. But uh, one British minister said to a colleague of mine, well, you know, the Americans, are, w- w- we actually asked him, well, you know, should we be courting the Chinese quite so energetically when the Americans are having this confrontation with them in the Pacific. And he said, well, the South China Sea, you know, the clue's in the name. It's near China, you know, and so it is going to be kind of dominated by the Chinese. Now, he was sort of joking, but not really, I think. And uh, so there'll be, uh, there is a kind of nascent uh, disagreement, I think, and it's not just the Brits, I think, who think that way, that maybe the Americans are pushing too hard in the Pacific and they're they're um, setting themselves up for uh, a disappointment or, or indeed a confl- an inevitable conflict. You hear that. Australian opinion is very interesting, oddly, because they, of all countries, have to think really hard about this because they're stuck out at the end of the Pacific. Uh, do they want the Americans to push back very hard or do they think that actually China should have a sphere of influence? And you'll get both shades of opinion in, in, in Australia. Um, but so... It's a debate the Americans are having, but also that their allies are having and that their allies will influence. And this question about spheres of influence also raises a broader issue about the extent to which the Americans should at least attempt to see the world through Chinese and Russian eyes. 
try to understand why they're behaving the way they're doing. And certainly for me, it's very striking, having been last year to Moscow and Beijing in swift succession, that the, the language that they talk is very similar. They argue that it's Washington, not Moscow or Beijing, that's undermining global order because they believe, I think wrongly, but uh, that the U.S. is deliberately sponsoring regime change all over the world. So the the Russians will point to Ukraine and say this was you know, the CIA, which was overthrowing a legitimate government, and that they'll be coming after us next, uh, that they... Uh, America is a kind of revolutionary force, if you like. And the Chinese, I think, although they talked about it less, were very unsettled by the pro-democracy demonstrations in Hong Kong, which could quite easily have got out of hand. And again, you talk to Chinese officials and they will, the less sophisticated ones are pretty, seem to be pretty convinced that this was all Western NGOs funded by the Americans deliberately making trouble for us. And uh, that, I think, is uh, there's a poten potential conflict there because if they believe, rightly or wrongly, that the West is out to, do, doesn't accept the legitimacy of their governments and is out to undermine them, that is a potential source of conflict. Now, there is a strong element of propaganda in these claims from Moscow and Beijing, but I think there's also a genuine fear that, uh, that unless they push back against American power, they could fall victim to American-sponsored regime change. And understanding that needn't involve conceding a sphere of influence, but I think it does affect the way in which America should understand the way its actions are going to be interpreted in, in, in Moscow and Beijing. So the vision of these uh, simultaneous challenges to American power in three different crucial arenas has also fueled now one of the oldest debates in American policy, which is about this idea of credibility. Now, credibility is a word you heard a lot in the Cold War. And President Obama's critics, both at home and abroad, argue that weakness in the White House has damaged the credibility of America's security commitments and as a result has helped to make the world a more dangerous place. And the thing that they point to above all was the failure to uh, enforce the red line over Syria in 2013, which you will remember when Obama had said if the Syrian uh, government uses chemical weapons, there will be military retaliation. He was on the brink of actually following through. Then he had second thoughts. Actually, again, the British playing a helpful or unhelpful role by voting against it in the House of Commons the day before. He then says he'll go to Congress and then the whole thing kind of disappears. And that, it's interesting, as somebody who follows the news, you, you see these events, and at the time you can't tell whether will this be something that people have forgotten, forgotten about a week later, or will it leave a lasting impression. And that was one that really has left a lasting impression. And uh, I think it unfortunately played into this image around the world of Obama as very, very averse to the use of military force, as vacillating and as weak. Now, as it happens, because I'm quite sympathetic to Obama, I think he probably made the right call. I think that it, was, it might have been a mistake to, to, to initially sketch out that red line. He would have, in fact, been bombing the Assad regime, and if a year later ISIL had risen up, as they did, everybody would have said, this is crazy, you bombed the wrong side. Uh, but nonetheless, the image of uh, Obama's fumbling there, I think probably did have some impact in encouraging both the Russians and the Chinese to be more assertive in their neighborhoods because they thought, okay, this guy is, is, is very risk-averse and perhaps we can, we can push it a little bit. And the vision of a Middle East that's falling apart is also further unsettling both Europe and Asia by, again, raising questions about international borders, about whether America is withdrawing from the world. And so even some American strategists who've long argued that the U.S. should rebalance its foreign policy towards Asia, should do less in the Middle East, if you talk to them now, they're having second thoughts because they're beginning to think that to the extent that we appear weak in the Middle East, we're now uh, actually undermining our power in Asia because these things are all about perception and they're linked and the perceptions are linked. So I think these credibility arguments contain some truth. But in my view, the implication that the U.S. must always respond firmly to challenges to American power is a mistake, because those who worry that American power rests above all on the nation's willingness to enforce its red lines, I think, are taking too narrow a view of what credibility means. And of course, the willingness to honor security commitments is very important. But I think American credibility and Western credibility more generally also relies on other things, and one of them is not making big mistakes in foreign policy. So to me, the two biggest blows to American global power and prestige since 2000 were self-inflicted ones, and they were the Iraq War, um, which damaged uh, 
the, the perception that America knew what it was doing and also um, created a backlash around the world and a backlash within the U.S. against the use of power. And the other, not entirely related to security, but was the financial crisis of 2008. And neither of those things had anything to do with an unwillingness to defend a red line. I think one key lesson of the Iraq War was that ill-conceived military intervention can be far more damaging to American power than hesitancy about the use of force. And in a sense, that's repeating a lesson that we learned, or that we should have learned from the Vietnam War, where, again, America was very concerned by this idea of credibility. Johnson, if you look back at what he was thinking, said if we back down, you know, there'll be a, less, a bad message sent all over the world. But in the end, America did fail in Vietnam, and actually that failure was what really damaged them and, and led to a, arguably a decade of perception of American weakness. So this question of the use of force is not as straightforward, I think, in terms, even in terms of credibility, as some people say. And there's an element of myth-making, I think, also in the uh, conservative attacks on Obama. Because for them, Ronald Reagan is the epitome of the strong president, and Jimmy Carter, now Obama, epitomized weakness. But if you look back at what Reagan did, he certainly increased defense spending. But he didn't do very much by the way of military intervention. The biggest military intervention was the invasion of Grenada, which had a population of 90,000 people. And uh, when in, in 1983 there was a bombing in Beirut which killed 241 U.S. troops, Reagan's reaction was simply to pull the Americans out. So uh, he has a reputation for strength because of what happened subsequently. But he actually arguably, deliberately or otherwise, had a broader vision of strength which was to do with uh, moral clarity, to do with building up the American uh, economic revival at home. And it wasn't really always to do with, uh, you know, using military forces very quickly or instinctively, as I think George W. Bush did in the aftermath of 9-11. And I think Obama's certainly grasped the point that U.S. global strength ultimately rests on the strength of its economy. And that's why he has this often repeated statement about the need to concentrate on nation building at home rather than nation building in foreign countries. And if you take a more historical perspective, I was, thank you for saying that I think historically, I, I, I try to anyway. If you look at the rise and fall of other global powers, I think that really reinforces the point because the decline in the power of Britain and France and the Soviet Union was caused ultimately by the fact that their economies were too weak to sustain their international commitments. And in all three cases, the cost of fighting wars had sapped the nation. So it was a, Russia's intervention or the USSR's intervention in Afghanistan was one of the things that really drained them throughout the 1970s. Britain's ability to sustain its empire was effectively ended by the cost of the Second World War, and the strength of post-war France was undermined by uh, ill-fated wars in Algeria and Indochina. And America, because it's had such a lead over other powers, has been able to make military mistakes and not really to suffer those consequences. But with China soon to surpass the US as the world's largest economy, I don't think America can assume that it can afford to make costly military errors long into the future. And the Syrian crisis, which uh, I mentioned, is a classic hard case. I think there are strong arguments on both sides of the debate about whether the U.S. should have intervened more robustly. But the recent history of American military interventions in the Middle East suggests to me that Obama's instinctive caution is justified. So you had a 14-year involvement in Afghanistan, which failed to achieve a conclusive defeat of the Taliban. You had eight years and many thousands of deaths on all sides in Iraq, failed to establish a stable policy. The overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya after a NATO bombing campaign has left the country as an anarchic wreck. And I think so this track record of sustained failure does seem to me to make Obama's caution about yet another military engagement, this time in Syria, pretty easy to comprehend. And then again, the accusations of weakness when it comes to China and Russia seems to me just reflect an appropriate caution about confronting two other nuclear powers. Uh, and on a host of other global issues, whether it's the management of international finance to nuclear proliferation to the climate change conference that's taking place in Paris right at the moment, it's simply a fact that America has to deal with China and Russia. So seeking to preserve a working relationship with Beijing and even Moscow isn't weak. It's, it's just a fact of international politics. And the credibility argument, I think, also fails to take into account the extent to which regional disputes though part of a connected global picture, also have very different local characteristics. So I would argue against this idea that America always has to respond forcefully. I think it depends very much on local circumstances. 
and dealing with the sensitivities of a declining power like Russia is likely to demand a very different approach to handling a rising power, a muscle-flexing power like China. I think in the Russian case, economics and time probably are on the side of the West, and that's less clearly the case when it comes to China. So I had an interesting conversation with a friend in Washington who said, was arguing that actually the pushing back in the Pacific was more justified than uh, pushing back against Russia. His argument being that Russia will, its, its challenge will fade and you don't want to stoke their sense of aggrieved nationalism. China, because it's on the rise, if you, if you give something, you're not going to get it back. Um, I don't know whether that's right or not, but it's, it's, it's just a way of thinking about these and suggesting these are not... It's, it's sometimes a mistake to join the dots. These are, can be seen as different issues. And I think for all the accusations of weakness, it isn't true that America has been averse to using force under any circumstances in recent years. We all remember the, uh, the successful killing of Osama bin Laden, the expansion of drone strikes in Pakistan and elsewhere, which have been rightly quite controversial. These are, these are not the actions of a president who's completely averse to, to using force. And although Obama has, I think, been understandably uncertain and sometimes uh, self-contradictory in Syria and Iraq, he is in fact using military force in the bombard bombardment against Islamic State. And America, I think the one thing about America that its allies and its enemies don't yet doubt is that it's, it's possession of military power. In fact, if you're looking at an indice of power on which America still is well ahead of everybody else, it is the military. Now that may be changing with the Russia's modernization of its forces and with a sustained Chinese military buildup, but for the moment, America has a military capacity that nobody else can match. However, unfortunately, the combination of the presidential election campaign and the terrorist attacks in France are once again increasing the pressure on the US and indeed on the Western world as a whole to escalate their military involvement in the Middle East. I think even after a long record of military failure in the region, the rhetoric of toughness is still very tempting for the leading presidential candidates, including Hillary Clinton, as well as Donald Trump or Marco Rubio. However, my guess is that Obama will uh, attempt to avoid ditching his innate caution by plunging deep into the Syrian morass, but he is tiptoeing in so that you've seen the bombing against IS, you've seen now the dispatch of special advisors to Syria. Um, a lot now will depend on whether they can coordinate things with the Russians and the French. But I think the accent will still be on diplomacy, and correctly so. The question is how far America feels it needs to use military force as a way of increasing its leverage at the diplomatic bargaining table. And oddly enough, that is how people think. So you hear in Washington people saying, now that Russia has intervened, we need to intervene as well, simply to even up our argument, or power of argument around the negotiating table, which seems a rather uh, calculating way of, of thinking about these things. But apparently that is one of the arguments that's gaining force. However, whatever they do over Syria, and that will become clear over the next few weeks, I think over the long run, greater caution and deliberation before taking military action, which has been a trademark of the Obama administration, I think is actually not a way of weakening American power. In the long run, I think it will help to preserve it. So that's my view, but I'm more than happy to, to take questions now. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, before we open the floor, let me add one more thank you to the Harvard Club of Spain that I did not mention before, uh, who is uh, for the third time, I think, co-organizing this event with us. And um, I blame the party that we had on Saturday, the gala dinner organized by Inigo. I'm still recuperating <laughs> from that. So thank you, Inigo, for the party and for co-organizing uh, this lecture. Uh, the floor is open. Uh, I don't know if, if Fidel, you want to, uh, to ask the first question, but just say your name and, and raise your hand, and I will uh, you know, say your name when you start your question, uh, and I will moderate the clock. <coughs> well, um, I'm always fascinated, fascinated uh, reading uh, Gideon Rajman or, or, or listening to him, uh, but I was wondering, one of the instruments of, of the realist school of thought that I think he's uh, close to uh, intellectually. And I think Obama himself has taken leaf out of this, also this doctrine, 
uh, and he admires, I think, George Bush's father uh, in the ways uh, he, he dealt with uh, uh, instability in the Middle East. I, I was saying that one of the uh, instruments is the balance of power, and this, uh, at one point you heard uh, talk in Washington about how you could play uh, Saudi against Iran, the Shias against Sunnis to, 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 to get a kind of, of balance in the, in the area. But I don't, I don't hear this talk uh, anymore. Do you, do you attribute it to any special? Yeah, well, I mean, I think on the realist point, I, I think you're right. One, one, of my, one of the quotes I most liked was there was a profile of uh, the former U.S. ambassador to Moscow, uh, his name now escapes his Stanford guy, um, Mike. His first name. But anyway, he, he said uh, about Obama, I think he's a realist, but he feels bad about it. And I, I, think, I think that's probably about right. I think that uh, you know, he appointed lots of idealists, Samantha Power and so on, to the UN. But I think as he looked at the world and what America could do, and it combined with his desire to avoid further military engagements, it led him towards a kind of realist position. On this balance of power, Saudi-Iran thing, I think it's like a sort of, you know, if international diplomacy really were like a game of chess, it would be a brilliant move. But it isn't. Uh, so it is true that I think that as they... I think one interesting thing that is going on in the West, actually, is an increasing hostility to Saudi Arabia that's coming to the surface. Uh, you know, mainly in the press now, um, many more critical articles about Saudi for all sorts of different reasons. It's partly, I think, people are fed up with the sponsorship of Wahhabi uh, thinking and the sense that we're now paying the price for this. Maybe we're less dependent on Saudi oil now, you know, with the oil price so low and with America now moving towards <coughs> energy independence. Um, so at the back of American minds, and maybe even sort of midway there, there is this thought, well, you know, maybe we could, if we, have, if we can build on the rapprochement with Iran... Uh, we can then sort of eventually switch horses. And Iran can be our ally, and Saudi can be kind of, we can wave goodbye to them. However, it's actually, of course, much more complicated than that. Firstly, uh, you know, Israel, which is you know, very influential in the United States, is much more concerned with Iran than with Saudi Arabia, and is a powerful voice in Washington. Uh, secondly, just because, I mean, as a matter of fact, from where we are now, the Iranians are much more hostile to the United States. They are developing or were developing a nuclear program. They are intervening in Syria. They are intervening in Lebanon. They're, they are actually much more of a destabilizing force than Saudi Arabia. People may resent uh, the way that the Saudis have funded Wahhabi mosques or whatever, but it is not the same as backing Hezbollah or whatever. So, uh, you know, we might want and Iran that suddenly said, yeah, we're also up for a rapprochement and a new relationship with the West, but it's not at all clear that that's actually on offer. And as far as we can see, there's you know, a very powerful argument going on within Iran itself, and it's not at all clear that the, let's say that Rouhani does represent a liberal school that would want that, that he can even win. I mean, he may have got his way on the nuclear deal. So, as I say, if it was a sort of idealized chess game, yeah, you'd make that move, but it's, 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 it's much more complicated than that. And on the question of um, uh, two further complications. First is this, uh, you know, in, in thwarting IS, and I think that the sense that Saudi has encouraged the ideology that's fueling IS is important. If you talk to the people who are trying to sort of run the intelligence operations that, that follow these, they will say, yes, of course what the Saudis have done is very unhelpful in terms of funding the ideology, but in terms of day-to-day -day cooperation and actually intercepting all this stuff, Saudi, the Saudis are very important. Actually, the Saudi intelligence services have been very, uh, you know, critical in providing intelligence. So that's a relationship you you, you rupture at your peril. Um, and then the other thing is that makes the kind of realist school about let's switch horses and you know balance one against the other is that one of the things that's clearly going on in the Middle East is that governments have lost control. So that one, there's another player on the stage, which is ordinary people who led the, you know, the, the uprising that overthrew Mubarak. I mean, the Americans didn't particularly want Mubarak to go. He was a cornerstone of their whole system. But uh, it wasn't their choice, and it wasn't, wasn't Egypt's choice either, so, uh, or Mubarak's choice. So even if you wanted to play this kind of high-level diplomatic game, there's a lot of sort of social turmoil that you won't necessarily be able to control. Thank you. Ferrano. Uh -huh.
So, thank you for for your lecture. It's a privilege to have you here, and thank you, Jose, for the opportunity to have lectures like this. Uh, like Mr. Senagorda, I follow you every morning eh, since a few years ago. So I remember two articles you wrote. One was U.S. China or U.S. make your choice. And there was another one. It was entitled When China Becomes Number One. Basically, what you are saying there is that uh, you cannot have trading relations with China and pretend to be under the American or the U.S. military umbrella, so to speak. Yeah? And uh, I, I want to ask you a question, the same question I presented to a, a high officer of the NATO when uh, this person visited us here. So, do you feel that a military confrontation, I mean a war, between the U.S. and China is not possible but likely? And what would be the red line that would trigger such a war? Because as China expands and they begin to stretch in, in, in the region, and a scenario where China invades Vietnam will not trigger many, uh, I don't know, support in the U.S. What if China decides to go over Taiwan, which is still an internal affair issue? What would be the red line that China should have to cross in order to trigger a, a military confrontation with, with the U.S.? And if you feel this confrontation is likely, not possible. Um, so just on the first point... I I didn't mean to argue that it's impossible to have uh, China as your major trading partner and America as your security partner, because that is actually the situation that many countries in Asia find themselves in. Japan, uh, South Korea, two prime examples. Uh, thousands of U.S. troops, their major trading relationship is with China. But all I want to suggest is that that's difficult, or it's going to become increasingly difficult because it gives the Chinese leverage over you economically. Uh, the Japanese, I think, uh, you know, have actually been scaling back their investments in China recently, or at least trying to diversify. The South Koreans possibly moving a bit towards the Chinese camp. Um, but on the question of military confrontation, no, I don't think it is. I don't think it's inevitable. I don't even think it's that likely. But I think it's more possible than than one would like, because these are two, you know, the two largest economies in the world. So if it were to happen, it would be a disaster. Um, how my, I mean, the reason I don't think it's likely under current leadership is that the, you know, we're talking about countries that are run by rational people, not by Kim Jong-in or even by uh, a Russian leadership that feels that it's been you know, on the defensive and, and traduced. I think that, oddly, the fact that China's been rising uh, is a force of peace because it meet, gives the, encourages the Chinese to sort of play for time because they think, you know, correctly, why would you risk a... The one thing that could derail them is a war. You know, if, if, they, if they had... Uh, if they just leave it for another 30, 40 years, then, and they are, you know, they're, they're Marxists enough to believe in the power of economics. Uh, they think that things will fall into their laps anyway, and they might be right about that. Um, I think that the dangers would be... Uh, and you see it a little bit now, the sense that China might, if, if the economy slows, that China might start encouraging nationalism uh, or if there's a domestic uh, liberal movement again. And Taiwan could be a flashpoint, as you suggest, because there are going to be elections there, I think, in January. And if the DPP win, as, as it looks like they will, um, they are in a party that at least nominally is kind of committed to independence, although I don't think they'll, they, they'll make... They won't declare independence. But China could react badly to that. Um, the other thing is always the danger that countries get, you know, that kind of what I was trying to talk about is the sense that everybody's calculating how everybody else is going to react. You know, if we do this, will America push back? If we don't do that, if they get it wrong, uh, if the Chinese, for example, think, OK, Obama's weak, he's not going to respond and they make a move in the South China Sea or something uh, that triggers an American reaction, that triggers a Chinese reaction. It's possible to imagine a situation in which countries don't intend to go to get into a confrontation, but they get locked into a logic of confrontation. But I think, uh, you know, people often make this comparison that almost any international crisis with 1914 and the outbreak of the First World War, but the difference being that in 1914, countries didn't have nuclear weapons. So they, they could, uh, 
think, okay, well, you know, maybe we'll, we, we, we should go to war. Whereas now, I think it really is, uh, unless you're pretty crazy, uh, you wouldn't want to risk that. So nuclear deterrence, I think, will probably keep them from going to war. Thank you. Right here. Thank you very much. My name is Miguel Lopez Silanes. I work in finance. I'm from the Harvard Club of Spain. Any any discussion on U.S. power brings us to the issue of the U.S. dollar, which is uh, one of the foundations of the of the power of the United States. Yeah. So many analysts worldwide feel that the U.S. is losing ground in this other theater of the conflict, which is the currency wars. We see the U.S. is highly leveraged. There is a new discussion going on to raise the, the debt ceiling. On the other hand, you have the Russians and the Chinese doing more and more bilateral trade in their own currencies. Chinese are dumping 50 billion per year of U.S. treasuries, buying gold. What are your views on this, uh, on this side of the conflict uh, going forward? Well, I, I think that uh, you're right, that the dollar, the use of the dollar is a, is, uh, a huge lever for America. And uh, you see it, for example, in the use of international sanctions, which are the, often the alternative to, to military force. Because um, one of the things that America's discovered is that although for a long time people said those oh, sanctions don't really work, financial sanctions, and particularly cutting countries out of the dollar system or out of the SWIFT financial transfer system, is enormously effective. And it wor really worked with Iran. And it's one of the things that the Russians are particularly frightened about because they, to trade with the world, they need to be able to use... Uh, international financial transfers, and the Americans can put pressure on SWIFT to cut them out of it by saying to SWIFT, if you don't uh, do that, you'll be, you'll be hit with sanctions in the United States, and you can't operate in the U.S., and for an international financial institution not to be able to operate in the dollar zone is uh, unthinkable. So they have a big weapon, and they uh, have, it's one of the things the Russians have been really, really worried about, that, that SWIFT would be used. And um, it's also why the Russians are now talking with the Chinese about setting up an in alternative payment system. But they're, it's quite um, in an early stages yet. So, but however, if the dollar stopped being the main means of uh, financial, uh, the main international currency, maybe the U.S. financial system would lose its centrality. Maybe stuff wouldn't have to be routed via America or using the... Uh, Western systems. So yeah, it is a system. It is a force of power, and there've been some. You, the whole question of the internet. You're in finance. So I'll be a bit careful about how, how I respond. But as I understand it, there's been a for some time a debate about the internationalisation of the RMB and how far it's going to go. And we saw, I think, today actually, the IMF saying that they're going to include the RMB in its special drawing rights, which is seen as an important step towards the internationalisation of the currency. However, the more I've looked at it, I think it's trickier than people realize because the RMB is not yet fully convertible. And if the people, and it, I don't think the world is going to put its savings in a currency that they can't move in and out of without, without uh, you know, any problem. And so that means, are the Chinese ready to go to, for, to full convertibility? I think they probably aren't yet because... There's been quite a lot of capital flight from China over the last couple of years. If they went to full convertibility, they don't know how much money would flow out of the country. Some a lot might flow in, but they can't be sure about that. Also, the, the economy is still pretty controlled. And uh, as I understand it, if you move to convertibility, you lose some of the levers that China uses to control the banking system, to control the amount of credit in the, in the economy. So it has potential implications for the thing that matters to them most which is control of the domestic system. Um, and then again, I think also, although things like debt levels, amount of trade, these are very, very important in the, what pe the confidence that beh is behind the currency. I think another thing that is important is just rule of law in the sense that uh, you know, if you have your money in an American bank, the government actually can't confiscate it, that there's a robust 
system behind it. Are people that confident that they would leave their money in Chinese currency at the mercy of the Chinese government? I'm not sure they are yet. Uh, and so I think my sense is that actually the dollar will continue to be the reserve currency perhaps for some time after China becomes the largest economy in the world because of the kind of institutional backing that it has. But we're all guessing. That, that would just be my, my sense. Um, Dr. Ricardo Altimira, I'm a lecturer at uh, Company of Jesus Universities, mostly in Latin America. And uh, thanks, Mr. Ragma, for the crystal clear painting of the uh, U.S. position in Europe, Middle East, and Asia. My question relates to Latin America, where there's no border, no religion wars, but there's a serious war against drugs, against narco-terrorism. And uh, I would appreciate your views on this particular continent and uh, this particular situation, if possible. Sure. Um, and it's, it's a continent I know less well, so, so f forgive me if my r remarks are a bit kind of, uh, you know, vague, or you can po you probably pull holes in them quickly. But it seems to me that one of the things that's happened that's, that's really of, of, of big significance is the opening to Cuba, which, you know, the, the relationship with Cuba has been a real problem, but not just between the U.S. and Cuba, but between the U.S. and Latin America. And if there's a rapprochement there, that takes some of the, one of the fuels of anti-Americanism in Latin America away. The death of Hugo Chavez, although, you know, Venezuela's not exactly back in the fold, it also removes another rallying point for anti-American sentiment. Uh, maybe if Cristina Fernandez, you know, she's now replaced by Macri. So that, that again, I think that sort of tradition of uh, anti-Americanism is weakened once again there. But it's still, you know, it's a long tradition, so it's not going to disappear. And there are other things that can fuel it, so that you saw the enraged reaction in Brazil, admittedly shared in Germany and others, by the news that the Americans had been listening to Dilma Rousseff's phone calls, the cancellation of a, of a state visit, and so on. And, you know, to the extent that America is also associated with capitalism and with the prestige of capitalism, if country, you know, Brazil's in deep economic trouble, Argentina's not in great shape either, and that might fuel the left, uh, which, uh, you know, over the long run, and that could then lead to a kind of uh, anti-Americanism. But my feeling is that the combination of just changing times and Obama's deliberate approach, uh, and maybe this, maybe Kerry's not entirely making it up when he says the Monroe Doctrine doesn't apply. I mean, I, I think it's harder to imagine America sponsoring coups in Latin America as they did in the old days of the Cold War. Uh, maybe that is beginning to take the sting out of those relationships. But you'll have other irritants like migrants. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if, say, a Republican were to come into power and to adopt a very hostile attitude towards Mexicans, uh, to Mexican illegal immigrants, that could be a, suddenly a fuel for uh, a difficult relationship. I mean, the other thing is that China's actually... You know, even visible in Latin America. I mean, maybe if their economy goes into a dip, that'll stop. But there have been huge, uh, at least, announcements of Chinese investments, you know, building these kind of imperial-style railways across the, across the continent. And uh, for Brazil, you know, one of the reasons the Brazilians are in trouble is the ch slowing of the Chinese economy. Uh, but it was... Uh, I remember the last time I was in Brazil, or the time before last... Um, Somebody saying to me in the foreign ministry, actually, China is more important to us now than the United States because they're our single biggest trading partner. And indeed, Dilma's first trip was to Beijing, not to Washington. So economics and that economic pull of China matters even there. Thank you. Jose Maria. Hey, good evening. Hey, Jose Maria Carlos Otelo. I'm also a Harvard alumnus. You were talking before of credibility and the strength of the economy as, as one of the main sources of credibility. How do you, I would like you to comment on how important do you think the tools of the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement or the Transatlantic Trade Agreement, what, are they important tools in the foreign policy of the U.S. In the, as a test of the U.S. power? Or would you think is there a similar thread in the, uh, in, in the agreement with Iran, as the agreement with Iran, one of the objectives is to bring, bring Iran back into the, 
the, the, the play of, of uh, the Western economy. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the TPP and, the, and TTIP matter in, in numbers of ways. I mean, first of all, as a test of whether America is still an, an international institution builder, because one of the sources of their power is the extent to which America designed and then supported the institutions of the post-war era, you know, the World Bank, the IMF, NATO, etc. Uh, they've kind of got out of the game of institution building. If they uh, get back into uh, TPP and then TTIP, those would be big gestures. But it's not clear to me that the domestic constituency exists for that. I mean, it was very cynical of Hillary Clinton, but she came out against TPP, having pushed for it very hard as Secretary of State, but now she's a candidate. She said, oh, it's a really bad idea. Um, and I think if she got in, she would, you know, uh, it's a bit like a, a kind of a conservative government of Britain make some token adjustments and say, oh, it's fine now, you know, that's what we're doing with the EU. Uh, but, but nonetheless, the, fact, the very fact that she felt obliged to make that statement shows that, that these big trade agreements, which used to be kind of non-controversial, are, are a difficult sell in America. Uh, on the TPP, I wondered whether it was too late in the sense that um, China is already the center of the Asian economy. It's the major trading partner for all the other countries there. Um, but maybe not, because we'll have to see how it works out. But the TPP, although they say it's not designed to keep China out, it's certainly designed to make it very hard for China to join because it demands all sorts of things in terms of the protection of intellectual property, in terms of independent trade unions that have enormous political implications that the Chinese would be unwilling to contemplate. Uh, and so it may in, in eventually have some sort of trade diversionary effect and create a kind of a trade block if it works and if it goes through... And it's certainly, uh, you know, I talked about sort of this is a chessboard. It's a big move by the Americans if they can make it work. Uh, TTIP seems to me some way behind TPP. And unfortunately, there's uh, opposition on both sides of the Atlantic to that, mainly actually on this side. I mean, I was kind of astonished when I was in Berlin most recently. You know, the people on the street handing out leaflets about how evil TTIP is. Uh, so... There, there is a kind of uh, left-wing kind of move against it in Europe, which I think will make it harder to, to, to get through. But I think if the Europeans are sufficiently alarmed by the sight of TPP going ahead and in wanting to uh, bind America in economically and politically, maybe you'll get enough momentum for that going. And then actually, I think on the other side of the Atlantic, that's, it's, it's not as tough a sell because uh, Europe, unlike Asia, is not associated with low-cost labor that costs American jobs. Uh, I mean, there'll be tough lobbying about with the farm lobby and the pharmaceuticals and all of that, and those are not easy issues to solve. Um, but, you know, it should be doable if there's enough political will behind it, but it will take a long time. No problem, then. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, thank you very much for a very uh, illuminating uh, speech. Um, my name is Gonzalo Alvarez Garrido. I'm, I'm a diplomat. Uh, mm, uh, I'm a bit maybe worried or surprised that you, you haven't hardly mentioned Europe. And uh, uh, Europe or the European Union or the Eurozone as a uh, potential ally or force of power in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, probably in the, middle term, in the medium term more the Eurozone if eventually there are some trends, some events recently that actually changes the, the whole uh, uh, frame, especially after the bombs in Paris and, and also the, the crisis of the Euro from which maybe we are learning and seeing the the need of uh, further integration, and also if in the long term we can really uh, depend on the United States to guarantee our security. So you haven't mentioned Europe. But sure. Well, let, let me, rectif there's, there's let me rectify that now. Is there some cost for that? Or, or maybe no, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, sort of probably a reflection of kind of British Euroscepticism, but it's also... Uh, <laughs> But it is also, I mean, because I was focusing on kind of hard security issues, 
in in the European context, the EU isn't yet a player in those areas, really. It, it is NATO, uh, and it's the individual nation states. Now, there's long been an aspiration to build that up. Uh, there is the European Foreign Policy Service, the External Action Service. Uh, there's talk of a common for foreign and security policy, but if you look at how people react to crises, uh, they haven't, say, in the wake of Paris, said, okay, well, now the European Union is going to take action. Hollande has gone to Washington, to London, to Berlin, Moscow. It's a very national capital-oriented way. And until I think you get a number of things, first in the an evening out of military spending across the EU, so that at the moment uh, the French and the British are still the, the largest military spenders and the most willing to use military force. The Germans uh, have a big military budget, but it's, it's, they don't, they're, not, they're not keen to get involved overseas. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, in their reaction to Syria, they're very concerned for obvious reasons about the migrant crisis. But there's almost no debate in Germany about, well, maybe we need to get involved in Syria and try in a kind of more forceful way to try to impose peace. Now, as it happens, you probably gather from what I said, I, th I can see why they think that. But that would be regarded, it le would at least be a debate you were having if you were in the UK or France or the US. You know, is there... Uh, something we can actually do to try to impose order on that region, and that's not just not how the Germans yet think. So I think that there's, there's a military spending problem, there's a difference in strategic cultures within Europe, of the sort I've just outlined, uh, there's an institutional problem, but that can be solved if you, if you fix the other two things. Um, and so for all those reasons, I, I don't think that Europe is an inconsiderable player in other arenas. It's huge in trade, it's big diplomatically, it will be important in climate, but on the questions, the security questions, uh, it seems to me it's not yet a, a significant player, uh, except maybe when it comes to sanctions on Russia, actually thinking about it. There, the EU, I think, did unexpectedly well, because normally when there's a big international crisis, that's when EU foreign policy begins to divide because people are really under pressure. On this, I was, uh, although there were different instincts in national capitals, they managed to forge a common position and they did impose sanctions. And that was a kind of a success for European Union foreign policy. So in that sense, I think that was quite an encouraging example. Okay, over here. Yes, uh, I, I am Paolo Marco, also from the Harvard Club. Uh, Mr. Ratman, I, I was really interested in your, uh, in your opinion on the evolution of the situation in Syria uh, that I have been following also very closely because of my work. Uh, if I try to, to analyze uh, non-emotionally uh, the, the, the role of, of the U.S. in the Syria crisis, at least in the last three years, what I can see uh, is that it has played some kind of, of role of balancing power. Uh, what I mean is that it has not allowed a the, the government to take over eh, to, the, to the rebels, okay, to, to win the war, but at the same time they have not wanted to provide enough support to the rebels eh, neither to, uh, to to take over the country. Uh, with the recent intervention in Russia, it's a similar situation. Eh, just as you know, one week after the Russians started the bombing, eh, you know, the rebels were flooded by new weapons, okay, coming from Saudi Arabia and, and the U.S. And so, well, my question is. Uh, I understand that the U.S. doesn't feel they are responsible to solve the, the problem in Syria. They didn't cause it. Okay? Uh, but they are not, in my understanding, they are not really playing a very uh, practical role in terms of finding a solution, rather than basically keeping this balance of power, which at the end of the day is extremely, is basically bleeding the country. Okay? So what is your understanding of the, the what's the end state? What do the Americans want? Well, what do they want? I mean, I, th I don't I I think it's not quite as Machiavellian as you suggest. I think they would like the conflict to end. But I think that there's a lot of division. Firstly, they don't, like all of us, cannot see the clear way of doing that. There's also, has been from the start, a big differences of opinion within the American administration about the best way to proceed. Uh, I think, I suspect Obama may now regret having called so early on for Assad to go. Um, I think he was advised by, by diplomats, actually, that it was only a matter of time and that he would, you know, you get on the right side of history, 
and that, uh, you know, so, so call for him to go because he's a kind of evil oppressor and he'll go. We've seen this happen with Mubarak, we've seen it happen uh, with Gaddafi, and this is just the next. And that turned out to be a misanalysis, but it slightly nailed the Americans on this thing that I was railing against, this idea of credibility, that you're not allowed to say we got that wrong because then people say, oh, well, you know, they're, 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 they're error-strewn and they change their minds and so on. So they're slightly hooked on the Assad must go thing. Um, but then the other thing was that there's a genuine argument about uh, how effective uh, military or support for the rebels would be. From the beginning, there were people in the Pentagon and Hillary Clinton and others saying to Obama, you've got to put more weight behind the rebels. Um, there were other people arguing back, and I think they were closer to Obama's instincts, saying, look, we don't really, you know, our experience in Iraq, Afghanistan, etc., is that we don't know these groups. We don't understand these countries. You supply weapons to one group, they'll go to another group. Are there, are, are the moderate Syrians really, do they really even exist? Uh, you know, some of them do, but do, will, they, uh, will they emerge at the top? And, uh, you know, one friend of mine in, in the Obama administration who was on that side of the argument said to me, you know, the one, I don't know how Syria will end up, but the one thing I can guarantee you is that the moderates won't win. And, uh, and that line of argument saying, be cautious, I think has guided American policy. And now that things have really gone terribly wrong with the rise of IS and 200,000 dead, various people are saying, sort of re-legislating that and saying, no, no, we got it wrong. If only we'd, you know, imposed a no-fly zone earlier or put more weight behind the rebels. We can't know whether that would have worked better. Um, but there is now more pressure to go in there. But I think there's still a sense, they still really don't know. You know, there are some people who would say, well, look, let's just bite the bullet, so to speak, and say, you know, that if the option, that the real choice now is Islamic State or Assad, and we're just going to have to go with Assad. And there are others who say that's a huge mistake. Assad is the source of the conflict. You'd be handing a propaganda victory to the Russians. You can't do that. And they're still arguing about this, which is partly why the policy is such a mess. Um, yeah. Uh, over here. You can just shout. I bet everyone will hear you. Yale alumnus. So oh, okay. Nice to be in the home of the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> Democratic opposition. Um, you, when you were talking about uh, TTIP, uh, you mentioned the importance of the, of the domestic constituency uh, in the States and how that was acting as a constraint, uh, potential constraint uh, on them. Um, and you referred to Reagan as being kind of seen after the event as a kind of great kind of foreign policy leader, but in many ways being more important for what he did domestically. In these moments where we're seeing in the kind of the early stages of the American presidential campaign, the strongest run by an avowedly socialist candidate since the late 1940s, uh, and uh, Donald Trump uh, continuing to lead or nearly lead the hmm. Republican field, do you, do you worry about the kind of long-term prospects for that American domestic constituency, because perhaps the, it's not so much a global test of US power, but actually whether the domestic constituency will allow its government to express that power internationally. Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, a problem, particularly for America and, and for all of us, because America is so important to the rest of the world. But there's a, an anti-elite backlash, I think, right across the Western world. Uh, so in a way, you could argue that Trump is part of the same phenomenon that Le Pen is in France and that you know, Jeremy Corbyn on the left is the part of the same phenomenon as Bernie Sanders is. Uh, and it's understandable that you know, we had a, m a massive recession uh, financial crisis which suggested that uh, the people running the economy didn't know what they were doing. Um, and we've also had that has accentuated a long period of income inequality uh, which has been rising and of, in the US in particular stagnant real wages for something like 20, 30 years for the most people at a time when the very rich have been getting even richer. And so the, the ability of the, uh, the kind of elite to command the support of uh, ordinary people for policies of globalization which seem 
A, to be promoting an economic system that isn't necessarily working in their benefits, and B, to possibly involving expensive foreign commitments that help foreigners when shouldn't we be spending that extra dollar on a tax break for somebody at home? I think, yeah, that is, that is, uh, that is worrying. And in fact, if you look back at those sort of, you know, I talked about that great years of institution building and, you know, most of those people were, were, were either Yale or Harvard men, you know, the Dean Atchison's and Avril Harriman's and so on. And they, they were often people who'd worked on Wall Street and moved seamlessly between Wall Street and the State Department and so on. And it, it, there was an American establishment which commanded, the, which was able to govern and was able to make these decisions and to get them through. Uh, if you look at the state of Congress now, I mean, Obama cannot agree any treaty. That's why the climate change stuff is going to be so hobbled. Anything that involves an agreement with foreigners is seen as part of kind of elite globalist conspiracy. Uh, and, you know, if Obama, who is the most sort of internationally minded, diplomatically minded president in, that I can remember for, for quite a while, can't get this stuff done, you do slightly worry about uh, the next American uh, president and how, how they're going to do it. And yet, on the other hand, I think that when they think strategically, the, the likes of Hillary Clinton, as opposed to when they're running for office, can see that actually these institutions are the core of American power as much as the military, and that America has to remain engaged in building these kinds of institutions. And I think that it's a source of chagrin for them that how difficult it is. I mean, so that they were very upset that this whole Chinese investment bank, which we joined and then other Europeans joined, the Americans have been trying to block. Well, the Americans will say part of the problem is that they couldn't get the reweighting of Chinese votes at the IMF, which the Americans had agreed to through Congress. And so the Chinese lost patience and started their own institutions. So it, it, they do pay a price for it. And it, uh, you know, unless you get what I'm afraid looks like a slightly improbable, not only just a resurgence of the American economy, but a resurgence of the American economy that actually spreads out more widely and, and gives a sense that the, the fabled American middle class are also benefiting. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to get that internationalist consensus revived. Uh, yes, I'm Jesus de Ramon Laca. I'm an advisor to the Spanish Minister of Defense. And it's just to take you back to uh, Syria and Turkey, the whole Middle East, and which I think has implications for the wider Sahel region in, in Africa as well, which is what we are seeing in U.S. policy at the moment is, on the one hand, we have fatigue from wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. On the other, you have the pivot to Asia, the effects of the financial crisis and everything um, and people are saying, well, they are kind of reassessing their position of the pieces in the chess game and stuff, and Obama is kind of urging caution with that. Um, what I maintain is that what they are finding out is that the chess pieces themselves, many of them, are no good as chess pieces. You're saying, well, before we thought we had Iraq, now we are saying, you know, you have Sunnis, you have Shia, you have the Kurds, that piece is no good. Once we took Gaddafi out of the pe picture, we're saying Libya is not really a chess piece. Um, Syria, for example, the Russians, as you say, at least know what horse they're backing. The West has no horse to back, and therefore it's not just caution, but with wider implications as well for the Sahel region, we in Europe have to realize as we go into these places that the USA has a kind of fatigue it didn't have before, and that be if intervention is going to be the norm, it's not going to be the kind of large-scale boots on the grounds, you break it, you own it doctrine, where they will go in and then try and invest 10 years or so in nation building. Anything that we do, or where we already are in, in the Sahel or in the Middle Eastern region, um, they might be a more or less useful partner, but they are going to come in as a partner. Sure. And we should um, start to realize that anywhere we go in or anywhere vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine as well, we are going to have to step up to this plate, which is very uncomfortable with us. And that's why I think the reaction of saying, well, Obama is an anomaly, he has no policy. Once the administration changes, we will see a clear reason. 
I don't think that's happening anytime soon, and I think that's going to be a useful wake-up call to Europe. Yeah, no, I, th I think you're right on that. I mean, at, at the moment, we've got one of the reasons... You've got a... I hate to use the phrase perfect storm, but I'll use it. Uh, you know, you, you, ha you have a US that's, that's pulling back a bit. You've got a Europe that has not yet developed, uh, you know, that, that isn't spending much on the military and hasn't got a coherent foreign policy. And you have... Um, the disintegration of regional orders to our east in Russia and Ukraine and to our south in the Sahel. So that's a formula for instability. Uh, one would hope that as the Europeans, as you say, realize that Obama is not an anomaly, uh, that they, and that th these are real threats we have to deal with. We can't just sort of, you know, bury our head in the Sahelian sand. Um, that, that maybe we will finally get our act together and uh, Cooperate. Whether I mean personally, I don't care whether it's on an intergovernmental level or on a EU community-wide level. It's just that they, they, people need to to cooperate more closely, and perhaps the threat will bring the the cooperation out. Uh, that would be would be helpful. Great. Two last questions. So well, three, but you know, can, can we group them together? So it'll be if you're Felipe, and then. Back there and back there. Thank you very much, Mr. Sman. I, my name is Felipe Sauna. I am a journalist. I've been working many years in international affairs and teaching international affairs in the university. A very simple question and a more complex one. The simple one. Why do you think Guantanamo is still open? The second one, let me put it this way. It's a kind of provocation. Uh, the Islamic State... Obama has not done anything serious, nor anyone else, to stop the consolidation of the Islamic State, in part because he has been pressed by the main Sunni powers, Sunni powers, to stop the expansion of, of Iranian influence after what happened, after the effects of the Iraq invasion. I mean... When you interview or you talk, probably you have had the same experience. Mm. Let's see, Jordanian leaders, Egyptian leaders, I am talking about 2004, 2005, 6. Practically in one minute, say, two, two minutes, they will start to criticize what the U.S. had done with the Sunni allies mm. and their main strategic interests. Otherwise, for me, it's very difficult to understand what has happened in the last year with the Islamic State? Thank you. Sure. Uh, Alvar Invernon, a researcher at uh, Sadegio. I would like to uh, to include in this debate uh, cyber security and cyber governance, because I think it's a key element for U.S. power in the future, and uh, it's creating big problems with allies, and at the same time, it's, I think it's, a <coughs> it's a, an issue in which uh, the U.S. doesn't have that uh, regional hegemony that you were talking before. And also, I think it's interesting to discuss about the cyber governance, because uh, this in cyberspace, there is a, a part of cyberspace uh, regulated by uh, multi-stakeholder governance, and another one that is closer to the ICANN, and, and another one that is more uh, in a traditional way based on a state that is related with the ITU. And I think it's interesting uh, how the U.S. is dealing with this uh, debate. Come. Okay, well, I'll start with that, since it's freshest in my mind. I mean, I think one of the really interesting things that we've seen in the Obama era is uh, far from Israel being able to control what the Obama administration has done, uh, they've had an open confrontation with them over Iran to the extent that Netanyahu went and tried to speak to Congress and, and didn't get what he wanted. Um, but on the other hand, I think one of the reasons that Obama was prepared to 
uh, stand up to the Israelis or at least face them down on Iran was that there was a lingering anger over the Israeli willingness uh, or unwillingness to stop building settlements. You know, I think one of the early things that led to this idea of a weak Obama was when he said to the Israelis, you should stop building settlements in the West Bank, and Netanyahu basically ignored him, and there was no comeback. Now, again, it's maybe it's like one of those things like Assad must go. It's one of the things you shouldn't say if you don't know what you're going to do if it doesn't happen. Uh, so it was an early mistake. Uh, but the Israeli-U.S. Um, relationship has frayed quite considerably under Obama. They don't get on Obama and Netanyahu. Um, that said, I think behind that there is a sort of bedrock and commitment by the Americans to Israeli security that will survive, um, and it's probably one of the things that keeps them involved in the Middle East. You know, if oil is less important now because of shale and so on, uh, well, what else is it that keeps them there? Partly habit, frankly. They've got all these bases there, and they just sort of think of themselves as a big power. But also the, the sense that whatever the disagreements with Israel, there is a sort of sense that, uh, you know, if I was Israeli uh, and I was worried about being invaded, I mean, the only country that I think ultimately would fight for Israel is America. Um, so, yeah, that, it's a complicated relationship. Um, on Guantanamo, actually, I, I, I used to know the guy whose job it was to close Guantanamo, and it was one of the most thankless tasks you could have, because I think Obama was sincere about the commitment, but you have to get rid of all these people and find places for them to go. Uh, so you, even if you think there's no case for them to answer, Congress won't let you move them to the United States. Look at, uh, you know, even sort of Syrian orphans are not allowed. So an ex Guantanamo inmate is certainly not going to be resettled in the United States. So you have to find a country that will take him. And uh, very often that just wasn't possible um, because uh, they, they didn't, they didn't, you had to bribe them, you had to cajole them, someone moved to Germany, someone moved to other places, but it was pretty difficult, oddly. Um, and then there's also a few who there's sort of outstanding questions about. Uh, and again, you know, one might think this is a horrible injustice. These people have been held for a very, very long time, and they are trying to get most of them out. But equally, if you're Obama, you know, one thing that could not exactly finish your presidency but hold it beneath the waterline is if you release somebody from Guantanamo and then they sort of commit a terrorist act a year later. So you have to be absolutely sure you know what you're doing. So that's why. I mean, I think that, you know, prob probably Obama's got a sort of to-do list for the last year of his presidency and I'm sure closing Guantanamo is one that he would like to be able finally to deliver on. Um, on IS, yeah, I mean, to the extent that it's I don't really understand the, you know, the, the intricacies of Sunni politics, but I think you're right. The, the, one of the big challenges is preventing it becoming the expression of Sunni discontent in the Middle East and, and grabbing that banner. I mean, clearly, the way in which the Iraqi government was run as a kind of slightly sectarian, Shia, Iran-backed uh, government did feed Sunni discontent, and the famous Sunni awakening had been crucial to... Uh, you know, initially stabilizing the country and then for Maliki to then lose the, the Sunni population again was a, a bit of a disaster. And it's quite interesting that, you know, we're so focused now on Syria as the center of uh, IS, but, you know, arguably Iraq's at least as important. I mean, they hold Mosul, which is the second biggest city in Iraq. They're led by a man called al-Baghdadi, which suggests to me that, you know, Iraq is kind of important to them. So uh, you've got to somehow find a, rebuild that bridge again with the Sunni population of, of Iraq and of the region. And finally, cybersecurity. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge uh, issue uh, with, with many, many facets. I don't know which, which to really pick on, but um, I mean, I guess the Snowden thing has, has brought it into the, into the limelight. And one of the interesting things is the way in which, A, it's made it much harder for America to get all this stuff that they want as they part of their intelligence effort. I wonder whether the Paris attacks will now slightly move the needle again within Europe and in the European Parliament about being more permissive about intelligence sharing and snooping, maybe.
Um, it's also, interestingly, really poisoned the relationship between Silicon Valley and, and the Obama administration, which I hadn't really picked up on until I went there. But the, the Googles and the Facebooks are absolutely livid because they feel that their businesses have been compromised by the sense that everything you do on Google is handed over to the NSA. So they're now promoting end-to-end -end encryption and all sorts of uh, clever ways of keeping your data secret from everybody except Google themselves. Um, and um, the government is very angry about that and is threatening to take them to court. Uh, so this idea of a kind of America Inc., which has a, a single view of cybersecurity, I think is not the case. And I think the Americans for a long time resisted international legislation on cybersecurity, partly because they felt they were so well ahead on this, that this was an area in which America led the world, uh, both commercially and also in terms of intelligence. Uh, and therefore, why would you want to regulate it when you were miles ahead? Um, I think that now, as the Chinese have become much more aggressive in their own cyber snooping on the United States, and the fears are growing that uh, if we're ever going to have another sort of major security setback, maybe it won't be next time, it won't be a plane flying into a, a skyscraper, it will be our computer systems freezing or going down. Uh, and that, think of the damage that could, that could wrought not just to the economy, but even, you know, if it's air traffic control systems, people could lose their lives and so on. And everything is so dependent on these relatively new technologies that we haven't regulated yet. I think they're beginning to come around to the idea that, well, maybe we do need some sort of international treaties regulating this. But accepting that intellectually is different from negotiating it and getting it done, which will be very, very hard. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rachman. Uh, this has been a great uh, both lecture and colloquium. I hope this is uh, the first visit of many more to our Aspen Spain activities, perhaps next time in the mountains of Ronda, where we have our own version of the Aspen Valley. Uh, thank you uh, to the Harvard Club of Spain and to Ria and Menendez for partnering with, partnering with us in this event. Thank, thank you, all of you, and we'll keep you posted about, uh, on our next activities. Good night.